Welcome to the Workers' Party podcast with Jyoti Bra. Great. So welcome everybody to the first of our Workers' Party podcasts. Uh, joining me today for a discussion about Afghanistan, uh, I have Dave Kerr, who's a former Royal Marine, uh, lives down in Dover. He left the service before the invasion of Afghanistan, uh, but has some interesting insights for us, and he's one of our Workers' Party members in the South. Uh, we have Richard, who uh, is currently living in China, but who's a former NCO in the British Army and served in Afghanistan uh, in 2012. Uh, and we have Caleb. Uh, I think everybody knows Caleb Morpin, probably doesn't need an introduction, but just in case, uh, he's an independent journalist, author and activist uh, based in New York City and regularly appears on RT as well as many other places. But I think RT is probably where most of our people would have seen you the most, Caleb. And probably they've seen you quite a lot on Moats as well, George's show uh, on Sputnik Radio. So just to introduce the topic, um, you know, there's been a month now almost of crying in the British media about the terrible tragedy of NATO forces, finally, after 20 years of war and occupation, pulling out of Afghanistan. But depending on where you're standing, that picture looks very different. The oppressed peoples around the world, the anti-imperialist forces around the world have been celebrating mightily because it is a huge, huge defeat. Uh, and in fact, that, that so-called pullout turned into a really quite catastrophic and shambolic rout. Uh, and the similarities with Saigon in 1975 were so clear, uh, you think they couldn't have designed it better uh, to, to, to draw those parallels, you know, right down to the actual photographs of the, of the choppers on the embassy roof, you know, evacuating the last of American personnel, um, official personnel, of course. Um, so really, you know, we've had all these crocodile tears shed over the plight of the Afghans, and that's what we're, our politicians and our media constantly say to us, oh, the Afghans who've been left behind to the mercy of the Taliban, you know, they pretend that this is what they're really, really upset about. Um, but we know, we know from the 20 years of brutal occupation, the bombings of women and children incessantly uh, in Afghanistan and the destruction of the life and livelihoods, the, the infrastructure um, and the economy of Afghanistan, that it's not the Afghans that our rulers are really upset about. So. Uh, Caleb, I wonder if you could open us up with just talking a little bit about what are they really upset over? Well, it appears uh, that Afghanistan, now that the United States is no longer occupying it, may be moving into better relations with Russia and China. Uh, we've heard figures from the Taliban express interest in the Belt and Road Initiative, in economic development. And I think that is, that is the real concern here. Um, I will say that this was... I wouldn't compare it to Saigon as much because I, I feel like this was a little bit of a handoff. Uh, you know, there were negotiations going on and it, it seems like at, at, at a certain date, uh, there was a feeling that they were going to hand uh, Afghanistan uh, over to the Taliban. Now, obviously the government uh, that the United States and Britain backed uh, fell a lot quicker than they anticipated. Um, and we had Nicolas Maduro, the leader of Venezuela, coming forward and saying that he believed bad intelligence was given to Joe Biden intentionally. Um, and that this is becoming a scandal in the United States. Joe Biden is being raked over the coals. He, they're saying the United States has been humiliated um, and that, you know, this is this is playing out uh, to look as if uh, the United States has completely uh, you know, has completely embarrassed itself and such. One thing you have to say is that there seems to be all this concern uh, for Afghan women and for the, the people, but where has U.S. media been for the last 20 years? I mean, for 20 years, the United States has been there um, and been, you know, bombing and killing and the poppy fields have been getting bigger for the narco gangs and the terrorist groups have been getting stronger. For 20 years, life has been miserable there. Um, and so it's not like the United States didn't have a chance you know, if the USA was really there to help the Afghans, it's not like they didn't have a chance to, to actually fulfill their goals. I mean, it's kind of it's kind of weird hearing them sit there. It's almost like they're saying, if we just had one more day, things might get better. Well, <laughs> you had 20 years. Uh, 20 years is a long time. And it's pretty clear the United States uh, wasn't making things better in the country. <laughs> uh, we will have to see what comes next, because uh, it's important to point out that 
And the Taliban is is a very, very diverse entity. Uh, there are some figures within the Taliban government who were in Guantanamo Bay uh, and were you know, put back in government. There are some figures within the Taliban government uh, who have a history uh, with Voice of America and with, uh, with you know, US state media. But on the other hand, there are people within the Taliban that seem very sympathetic to China and Russia. There are people within the Taliban uh, who seem you know, to be making some pretty anti-imperialist statements. So we're gonna have to see how the Taliban ultimately rules. Um, but the United States, I think that their occupation of Afghanistan was intended to use Afghanistan as a strategic epicenter. They wanted the instability and chaos, the drug gangs, the terrorist groups to spread over the border into China to spread over, uh, you know, north up into Russia and to spread over the border into Iran. And we know that there were separatist groups uh, that were trying to break Sunni regions of Iran away uh, that were, you know, being backed by the United States that would then go over the border into Iran. Uh, we know about the situation with the, with the Uyghur separatists and the, you know, pan-Turkism that China has been dealing with. Uh, we know about the, the global, you know, you know, opium and heroin epidemic, uh, which, you know, was, you know, as a result of that. So, you know, the United States was kind of using Afghanistan as a strategic epicenter of chaos. Um, and now the United States has made a strategic decision to withdraw. Um, and I think there are, there are probably elements in the U.S. deep state that are hoping that uh, that uh, that maybe uh, that this will cause Russia, China and Iran problems, that they'll be spending so much of their resources trying to stabilize Afghanistan, that the United States will be able to escalate its its interventions in places like Latin America. So we're just going to see what comes out of this. But there is a lot of potential now for peace and uh, there's a lot of potential for economic development. The road to a better Afghanistan is raising people out of poverty. It is jobs. It is economic opportunity. Uh, and the United States has not provided that in 20 years. Absolutely. And I want to come back to some of those points in a little bit. But first, I'd really like to hear uh, from our soldiers a little bit about, um, you know, how how they think, how, how they themselves as former soldiers and how the people they know um, are feeling about looking back at what's what's been happening. You know, we had 20 years of overt war and that followed 20 years of covert war. Right. That's 40 years of devastation and decimation wreaked on Afghanistan and its people. And, you know, what was it for? So I just wonder how do people who served in Afghanistan, how do former soldiers feel about the reality versus the narrative that was used to justify the invasion, justify the occupation, justify sending soldiers into that war? Richard? Sure. Um, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, I've got a few things to say, I guess. Uh, just on the first thing about um, the Saigon reference, uh, you know, uh, at least even with Saigon, it took two years before the American, uh, before the regime actually collapsed. Uh, you know, the troops pulled out in 73 and uh, only two years later, they actually take over. Whereas um, the uh, former Afghan government, uh, those guys, but the US hadn't even left yet. You know, the, the troops were still on the ground. Um, so to use the term puppet regime almost seems like an insult to puppets. Um, you know, they, they fell so quickly, so rapidly. And um, I was listening to somebody the other day that um, Ashraf Ghani was apparently you know, left with you know, buckets of cash uh, flown out of the north of the country into Tajikistan. Um, so uh, it, it's, uh, yeah, it's, 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 um, it is a, a, an interesting, Oh, sorry, mixed feelings about the thing. Uh, particularly, you know, on the ground, there were there were projects. You know, you did have schools, you did have universities, uh, and some infrastructure things going on. Um, they it's not like they didn't exist. Um, but you know, looking back and also looking at the reality now, it seems that you know, at the top of this project, uh, this twenty-year project, um, you know, so the fish rots from the head. And it seems like at the top of this setup um, was a very weak, uh, corrupt and, and frail thing, um, extremely weak. Um, you know, that, like I said, before the troops were even gone, before the US had even left, they still had air cover, air support in some shapes and forms, and they, they had already fallen. Um, in terms of also <laughs> um, listening to Biden speak the other day, uh, obviously a few days after the fall had happened, and... Um, you know, he said, um, when would we have pulled out? When was a good time to pull out? And, and it actually, I think he was actually right that after 20 years and so many troops and so much money that there was never a, a good time for the US to pull out. The, 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 the thing was probably doomed from the beginning, it seems. Um, 
you know, obviously what we were doing there, what we were told and the sort of the name of the mission was nation building and, and these kinds of things. Um, and, you know, sure, valiant efforts. And, and yes, like I said, there were projects by NGOs and, and various things, but uh, you can't, you can't hotwire a nation. I don't think someone else can build your nation for you. You can't take the wires and smash them together and hope that you build a nation like that. Um, and if you think that's possible, I don't think the Afghan model or how they did it or uh, how it was ex executed is the model, how you, you can do that, if you can do that, which I, I don't think you can. Um, so yeah, I guess those are some of my feelings on the matter. Um, yeah. Hey. Yeah, obviously, uh, like I said before, gladly, I never had to serve in Afghanistan. I left in 1994. I have, however, been in a lot of contact with former brothers, uh, mainly in the uh, maritime security role, where I, I work with a lot of young lads who had just left the Marines and done several tours of Afghanistan. But the thing that came to head is... It, 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 and it felt quicker than anticipated. And who anticipated? I'll tell you who, who's making that statement is people that, that have lied to us for years. I haven't got a clue. When I speak to guys that were actually out there, maybe Richard will back me up, when the uh, combat operations stopped, and this is from a good source, this is from a guy who just left in February and was in Afghanistan last year, and has done seven tours of Afghanistan. Um, when combat operations stopped, uh, cut the short, he phones me every Monday, normally to uh, rib me about my football team losing on the Saturday, but I decided to carry on the conversation and asked him, when you were in Afghanistan, what do you think about what was happening? He says, it came to no surprises me, Dave. He says, because when combat operations stopped, he says, our command and control were a little bit confused about the way the Afghan army were being used. He says, and quite simply, you could see the Taliban moving into the towns and cities. He says, so it was no surprise to us that when the announcement was made, they basically walk out the front door with an AK-47. They were already in Kabul. They were in Kabul weeks, weeks, weeks before any announcement was made waiting for this announcement. Whether we're not party to this, are we? Negotiations uh, had pre-warned them of dates, etc. before the media announcement. I mean, if this is the enemy, to give the enemy, enemy dates of withdrawal is probably one of the worst military tactics ever you could ever do. Yeah. Um, Afghanistan was a mistake. But the one thing I really do have to say, having spent time talking to young lads, is I'm absolutely proud of the work our guys done on the ground. That's your grunts, your soldiers on the ground. I don't think they could have done any better. Maybe poorly led. They, they were sent, sent to do a job. They've done the job to the best of their ability. Yeah. yeah. And there's a great number, obviously, didn't want to be there. You know, they, they, we're in the armed forces. We do a job. We follow orders. We, we do have thoughts. And it was my thoughts that made me leave in 1994. Uh, what was I then? <laughs> four years short of a full, full pension. But to me, my moral said, no, no, time to go. So go and go and what they've said. Now, th this is hearsay for me. I have no experience, like I've said before, I wasn't there. Hearsay to me was the strength of the Afghan army. There was no strength in the Afghan army. You had bravery beyond words from the Afghans. But when your command and control breaks down, there's nowhere else to go. Their command and control broke down several weeks before the pullout. Richard will probably tell us command and control was lacking severely in different areas way before any announcement. Mm -hmm. So, quicker than anticipated, 
Yes, Mr. Johnson, probably quicker than you anticipated, but the guys on the ground, the working class that are out there doing the job, they anticipated it. You got it wrong. Yeah. Thanks, Dave. I'd just like to add yeah. to, to what Dave was saying. Yeah, I mean, uh, I was speaking to some other Australian veteran who, who I know here, and uh, he served in 2003, mm -hmm. and um, we were talking about, you know, why did we get into the army? And uh, for him and for all the lads that I served with, it's not, it's never a, you know, I don't think I ever discussed politics with lads I was with. You know, we were in basic training or basically any sort of normal interaction or normal conversation. We wouldn't talk about, oh, you know, let's go, we've got to go to Afghanistan and fight the Islamic insurgency and, and fight for the, the Western values of democracy, et cetera, et cetera. It wasn't, that's not something that soldiers necessarily talk about. I mean, it's not something that the lads I served with ever really talked about you know it's a job and usually you know they come from uh, poorer backgrounds working class backgrounds you know from uh de-industrialized cities and all this kind of stuff places that don't necessarily have uh, the best opportunities so uh yeah just echoing what dave was saying there that the the lads you know they are just there to do their job they get sent by uh, the political masters and um that that's that's the truth for that um there's no rabid uh i don't know politically charged you know soldier common soldier that has a, a view that they're going to save the world or something like that most of the soldiers almost every soldier that i ever met was just a lad doing a job um and to the best of their ability um and you know sent to wherever the political masters choose uh so, so that, that that's that's true um in terms of the afghan thing about command and control yeah i mean it's I mean, obviously, there's certain stories I can't really share the details of it too, too uh, you know, gruesome and whatnot. But um, you know, there there are uh, there was a big problem uh, even in 2012 with commanders. Um, you know, whether it was just the lack of sort of um, be, being too much of an ego, so you'd have a commander that would demand to do a mission, and you'd have all of issues like that. But um, also just sheer corruption as well. Um, we had vehicles that would be taken or, or you know, wouldn't be delivered. Uh, and also we just had, there were, it was obvious that the numbers didn't make any sense. There would be uh, soldiers that weren't there, you know, the, the ghost soldiers they talk about. You'd have a camp next to ours where the a a would be and our camp would be here. And you'd go into their side and, um, you know, it, it wasn't being run very well. You could tell there was things missing and uh, yeah, command was not great. Um, the paychecks, Richard. Uh, what's that? The paychecks, the paychecks. Yeah. When I said yeah. to him about they had an army of 350,000, he says, no, Dave, they have 350,000 paychecks. Right, right, exactly. That's it, that's it, that's it. Um, I mean, also, you know, just there was lots of times you'd find um, uh, the soldiers also didn't have any more. I mean, well, it's, it's a difficult one. Like like Dave said, they did. They were good soldiers. They were brave Afghan soldiers, too. Um, it's not a one size fits all story, but uh, uh, there was also lots of, you know, smoking marijuana, um, disillusioned soldiers too from their side. So it's it's not a simple sort of story with one, one narrative. There's lots of parts to it. Um, yeah. There's definitely a couple of threads that I notice in this, um, you know, as the picture becomes clear and as so often with imperialism, it's in its defeat, it's, it's in its uh, suffering. suffering. It's when it's um, fighting amongst itself, you know, its leaders, that we start to see the details that before have been hidden from our view. You know, Afghanistan is a story that the media has been anxious not to report on for a very, very long time. We've had very scant information and details. Little bits come here and there, um, odd little exposés or or PR stunts or whatever, but the big picture doesn't come. Now when everybody's looking for who to blame, was it your fault? Was it your fault that everyone's passing the buck? Then we see some of the details coming out, which are really instructive, actually. Just as with Iraq, do you, I don't know if you guys remember, but when the, when the occupation of, of Iraq began, a huge load of Iraqi money was stolen and used to fund the occupation and the nation building that they were pretending to engage in there. But it was cash. And they were sending soldiers and diplomats around the country with wads of cash to do who knows what with. There was no oversight. There was no uh, reporting back of what had happened to this money. And so guess what? 
when they came to do their sums later on, when they, when people started to recriminate a little bit and there was a tiny bit of like, what, what happened there? There was like, I can't remember now, some millions, many millions, hundreds of millions, a billion missing. I can't remember the number now, but I remember, you know, the stories about it. And we're seeing the same in Afghanistan, that essentially with no oversight and with money just being thrown without the need for any kind of... Um, uh, uh, what do you call it? accounting? Yeah. Um, this, all these ways of just pocketing money, you know, have uh, made themselves available to people who who want to do that. And whether it's you know the odd uh, local warlord who's just on the make. Yes, I can say that I've recruited you know fifty soldiers and actually send them five and pocket pocket the money. Um, or actually, it's it tends to be the people at the top, you know, it's the Halliburtons and the, the directors of the arms companies and the, they run, they realize they're onto something. They can send a bill to the Pentagon for 30 helicopters and send a chitty to the Afghan army for 10 helicopters, you know, and who, who knows who's checking, who's checking the difference, you know? So this, this route for money-making, you know, it's one of the reasons we say that corruption is at the very heart of capitalism. And everywhere you look in a capitalist or an imperialist venture, you see this rampant, rampant corruption. Um, and it's just, for me, it's just one more example, you know, of, of how that operates. And the, and the absolute sort of moral vacuum when it comes to money-making, you know, that, um, that it has a logic of its own, doesn't it? That, that the, the motivation of, of money in a society brings with it all those behaviours and, you, and you're not going to get rid of them. And all this kind of shock and outrage is, is um, you know, it's useful education for the people, but who's actually shocked that all these people are on the make? What did we think they were there for? You know, it was it been clear for a long time it wasn't to help Afghan women. You know, the best uh, situation for Afghan women was 42 years ago. Mm. You know, which they yeah. moved heaven and earth and poured trillions in to destroy because an independent Afghanistan slap bang in the middle of Asia, bordering on all these, you know, vital areas and and countries of concern to the imperialists cannot be allowed to exist independent, socialist leaning, you know, Soviet friendly, or no, 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 to, to the imperialists. And, um, and that was that. And the amount of blood and treasure that's been spent, you know, I, I, the, the soldiers I've talked to, uh, and obviously I'm not a military person, but you know, they feel really disillusioned. And, um, you know, they think about their comrades who've died, who've been wounded, and they realised they were sold a pack of lies. You know, you're right, Richard, that they go, you know, they're working class kids. They're not particularly p politically engaged. They're just trying to do their job that they've been trained to do. They haven't thought too hard about it. They've trusted that the people who send them to war know what they're doing. But they do get given a story, don't they? What they're doing it for. We're doing it to help the Af We're here to help the Afghans protect themselves and help Afghan women build universities. Mean, they were building schools and universities back in the 70s. What happened to those? You know, the women were, what, what happened? Of course, the young kids being sent in don't know that, but they're starting to, to find out now. What they can see now is 20 years after the invasion, um, the Taliban is back in control and in better control than it was in 20 years ago. But it kind of leads me on a little bit to an, another question I had. Um, really for Caleb, I guess, about the Taliban, because we know that the original, you know, Taliban 1.0 was founded um, by the imperialists as a force to be used against uh, the Soviet friendly government as a destabilizing force. And they threw money and weapons uh, and training and propaganda support at that movement, hand over fist, in order to destabilize both Afghanistan and the Soviet Union by proxy, but really to, to destroy that government, that independent government that was in Afghanistan. And in so doing, they also destroyed Afghanistan, you know. Um, but now the Taliban, having come to power with the blessing of the US, the Taliban 
back in 1996, its government was making good friendship overtures to the government of George W. Bush. Well, that wasn't 96, was it? Whenever he came in, um, you know, making oil deals or talking about the pipeline deals they were going to do. And that's something that, you know, I remember writing about this at the time of the invasion of Afghanistan, you know, that actually that pipeline deal had gone sour because the Taliban got a little bit of independent mindedness. They decided that they were going to cut poppy production in Afghanistan, which they actually did, and which hugely messed up the global uh, heroin trade, which the US uses in all sorts of ways. And they wanted a bigger royalty on the proposed pipeline. I mean, you'd think it's a small thing, right, for a country to say, well, you know, if the pipeline's going to go through, we should have a royalty that's a bit meaningful. But these two things combined, as far as I could see, um, really put the imperialists out of love with the Taliban, really put them out of love. They thought they were becoming a bit independent and they didn't like the look of it. They were, they'd put them in power to be a puppet regime and they started to think for themselves. But what's interesting to me is after 20 years of being the figurehead of the resistance and being synonymous with Afghan resistance, what I'm interested to know is, do people feel that we're looking at the same Taliban we were looking at before? Because it seemed to me that Taliban has become not so much a you know, single-minded Islamist movement as it was originally envisaged, as a kind of a brand name for a national resistance movement, which is quite a different thing. And Afghanistan has, from what I understand, quite a history of, you know, um, you know, it has a culture and a history of pragmatism when it comes to joining forces uh, against, against outsiders in particular. So I wondered, Caleb, if you had any thoughts about that. Well, there's a lot that could be said there. Um, when you talk about uh, the corruption uh, that went on, uh, one of the most wild stories we saw in American media was that it was revealed uh, about a year ago that a number of American companies were just handing out cash to the Taliban. They would build a building and they didn't want it to get blown up. So they would then go meet with the local Taliban and give them thousands of dollars uh, not to blow up their building. Um, and you know, this is who we're supposed to be fighting against. You're giving money to the, the enemy, but this was just standard practice for all these Pentagon contractors. Um, and, uh, you know, if you read some of the, the documents that, that, you know, we, we, we are sure they have internal conversations that we, the public, are not privy to. Uh, but the writings of William S. Lind uh, have been published uh, when he comes up with this concept of fourth generation warfare. And they talk about, uh, about how, you know, counterinsurgency tactics have been kind of reinvented since the Vietnam War and how the handing out of cash uh, is a method and how uh, the cultivation of different proxy forces, it's more effective to cultivate a domestic proxy army to fight uh, local forces. And it was revealed, the New York Times has revealed that there have been a number of CIA operatives who have died in Afghanistan who were embedded with various local Islamic fighting groups. Um, and we don't know which groups they were particularly embedded with. Uh, the Port Authority police of New York and New Jersey were embedded with Jindala, which was a separatist group that was trying to break the Sunni regions of Iran away from Iran. Um, and so much so that they knew about terrorist, terrorist uh, that, were, that were intended to take place in Iran. Uh, and they told, you know, the, the Port Authority police told US officials about this and US officials didn't give that information to Iran and all kinds of civilians were blown up when the Jindala terrorists were operating there. Um, so there, there are details about this that, that have come out. I mean, apparently a number of these, these Islamic terrorist groups in Afghanistan are being, you know, have been armed and supported by the United States. Uh, furthermore, the United States was giving money to the Taliban to not blow things up. There's a lot of, there's a lot of details there that, that are going to come out eventually that we'll find out about how completely disorganized this occupation really was. And, and even with their, their you know, reinvention of counterinsurgency warfare, they weren't able to really stabilize Afghanistan. Um, when you talk about the history of Afghanistan, I mean, you know, after the, the Bolsheviks took power in, in the Soviet Union, uh, one of the first things they did was they convened the Conference of the Peoples of the East. Uh, and they met with people throughout uh, Eurasia. And one of the people they met with was the, the infamous Emir of Afghanistan. 
And uh, the Emir of Afghanistan was not a liberal by any means. He was not a progressive by any means. But, you know, Vladimir Lenin made clear, he said, we would support anyone against the imperialists, including the Emir of Afghanistan. Um, and, you know, you know, Lenin and the Emir of Afghanistan had a good relationship. And the Bolsheviks offered military support uh, to the Emir of Afghanistan in his fight against the British Empire. Um, and uh, that kind of showed the commitment to anti-imperialism and how the Bolshevik understanding was that capitalism in our time is imperialism. It is the domination of the world by big banks and corporations based in the Western countries that are holding back economic development around the world um, and that it was in the interests uh, of the, the Bolsheviks and the working people of the entire world uh, to, resist, uh, to resist imperialism and to align with any force that would re you know, resist imperialism. Uh, no matter no matter what its ideology or perspective. Um, and I think that's one particularly interesting anecdote from Afghan history. I think Stalin in his book, uh, The Foundations of Leninism, he also references the Emir of Afghanistan and the, the Soviet Union's support uh, for the Emir of Afghanistan in, in its fight against the British. Uh, the other thing that I, I think is interesting is, you know, when you talk about in the 1970s and 80s in Afghanistan, what was going on there, um, you know, we now have, I mean, it's, it's a matter of public records, big new Brzezinski, the longtime U.S. strategist came out and he said it was the Afghan trap. Uh, the United States provoked a situation in Afghanistan where you had a monarchy in Afghanistan that was neutral, that there was a very pro-Soviet political party, the People's Democratic Party, um, but there were also pro-U.S. forces and you had a monarchy that was friendly to both the United States and the Soviet Union. And you had the situation where, where Brzezinski admits what happened was the United States pressured the, the Afghan monarchy to begin a huge crackdown on the, the pro-Soviet People's Democratic Party, uh, which had a lot of support in the military and basically forced them into a situation where they had to take power. Um, you know, you know, they didn't have the support among the rural population that they would have needed to have a stable, you know, coming to power, but they did have support in the cities and among the military. And so when, when the United States, you know, kind of forced the monarchy to start cracking down on this major political party that had support in the military, they basically had to have a coup and take power in order to not be killed. Um, and so you had a situation where the People's Democratic Party in 1978 took power prematurely. Um, and then almost as soon as they took power, the United States was ready to go with Osama bin Laden, uh, with, you know, al Zarqawi and others who, who just poured into the country and fomented this insurgency. Um, and that then, you know, of course, the Soviet Union didn't want to have a, a base of anti-Soviet anti Islamic fighting on its border. Uh, you know, right there in Afghanistan. So the Soviet Union was then obligated to support their aligned political party, the People's Democratic Party, to intervene. Um, you know, we get these crazy narratives where people say the Soviet Union, quote unquote, invaded Afghanistan. Well, no, they were invited by the government and, and they invaded it because they wanted hot water, they wanted water, drinking water or something from the ocean. It's this, this elaborate story. And it's like, it's very, it's very clear why the Soviet Union intervened. They intervened because their aligned political party was forced to come to power in order to not be wiped out. And then as soon as it came to power, it faced a, an extremist terrorist campaign, um, at which point uh, that terrorist campaign was not simply for Afghanistan. Um, you know, you already had a, a Chechen uh, anti-Soviet insurgency that was backed by the United States and Saudi Arabia. And the plan of Brzezinski was to spread an Islamic insurgency all throughout the Southern Soviet Union and to turn Afghanistan into a base to spread terrorism all throughout Central Asia. And so the Soviet Union obviously felt an obligation to intervene and support their allies. And then when they did, according to Brzezinski, the plan was to, uh, was to hand the Soviet Union, give the Soviet Union their own Vietnam. Um, and to demoralize them. And it's, it's, you know, they make it sound like nobody in Afghanistan supported the People's Democratic Republic. Well, the Soviet Union withdrew its forces in 1989. Um, so they withdrew all their forces, but the People's Democratic Republic of Afghanistan held out until 1993 without any Soviet support. They were not getting any Soviet support, but they held out that long against forces that were backed by the United States and Saudi Arabia. And so, the, the idea that they didn't have any support is completely out, outrageous. Now, what's interesting is that the Taliban is a little bit, you know, there was the, the insurgency that was, you know, there was Osama bin Laden and other forces. The Taliban is actually, there was a divide in the insurgency. There was, there was one section that was, you know, fully in with Saudi Arabia, but the Taliban were a little more of a domestic 
wing of that insurgency. Their interpretation of Islam was a little more Afghan specific. They weren't as, as loyal to Saudi Arabia. And, and there was a fight between, between the US backed forces after the People's Democratic Party was defeated. Um, and the Taliban was the little more domestic uh, version of it. And one thing that the Taliban did was they, they started burning down the poppy fields and arresting the, the heroin dealers so much so that the UN the United Nations gave them awards for what they did and praised them for their efforts to, to stop the, the heroin trade. Um, you know, and uh, uh, that's when I, I do recall, you know, I was a child, I wasn't paying huge amounts of attention to, to politics at the time, but I do recall it was like suddenly, you know, it was before 9-11, you know, suddenly we were starting to hear the Taliban were no good in US media. They destroyed some ancient Buddhist statues. And I mean, as if there aren't regimes all over the world that engage in religious suppression. But suddenly, I remember even as a kid, it was all over media. Oh, this government in Afghanistan has blown up these statues. They're awful. And I, I you know, and all of a sudden, it was part of part of being a good, socially aware, socially conscious American was you, you had to hate the Taliban because they were no good because they blew up some statues. And, and um, what's particularly interesting is if you look at that time period, right, in the lead up to 9-11, what was going on was that there was starting to be a blowback around the world against neoliberalism. After the fall of the Soviet Union, the United States, the sole superpower, they were imposing free market neoliberalism in Latin America and Eastern Europe um, and the world the world was just suffering. I mean, there was mass death and you know, people were losing their jobs and a rise in the heroin trade and a rise in sex trafficking across Eastern Europe and poverty everywhere in the United States was just imposing neoliberalism everywhere. Um, and then you had in, in Venezuela, you had the election of Hugo Chavez, which was a turning point against neoliberalism. And in Russia, you had the victory of Vladimir Putin, which was a turning point against neoliberalism. He was seen as, as somebody who was not Boris Yeltsin, who was not going to cooperate with the United States. And in South Korea, you had the sunshine policy, where suddenly you had leadership in South Korea that didn't want to fight with North Korea, that wanted to negotiate with North Korea. Um, and you started to see the beginning of, of global resistance to neoliberalism specifically centered in you know in in Russia and in and in Asia and that's when uh, you know following 9-11 you know and especially following the the oil pipeline that didn't go through um, that's when the United States uh, you know made this decision they had to intervene in Afghanistan and we were told well that's because Afghanistan and the Taliban was supporting Osama bin Laden uh, we now learn that the details of that are not even really accurate right we, we learned that, uh, that the, the Taliban was willing to hand over bin Laden they just wanted to put him through their extradition process or something like that. And that wasn't enough. Um, and we were, you know, they were harboring him. And, and after all this, we learned that, you know, the United States killed Osama bin Laden in Pakistan. Not, 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 it, it, he was not in Afghanistan. So the whole, the whole conflict, uh, the, we've been told a pack of lies. And it seems like, again, this was, it gets back to Zbigniew Brzezinski, who was the mastermind behind the, the U.S. intervention there to overthrow the People's Democratic Party. He wrote a book in the 1990s about the U.S. strategy to control the Eurasia, uh, Eurasia. and basically what he, he referred to is he referred to, he said, he said that the strategy is to, quote, keep the barbarians killing each other. That's what he said. Those are his words, um, you know, and that that Eurasia, you know, the Nazis were desperate. That's why they in, invaded, invaded the Soviet Union. They were desperate to control the Eurasian landmass, that if you can dominate, you know, you, you know, that that big area of land that is Russia and China, that is Central Asia, you can dominate that, you can dominate the whole world. And the U.S. imperialists know that. Um, and historically, um, and we're talking for thousands of years of geopolitics, those regions have been strongest when they're unified. Right. Um, the reason that Ivan the Terrible uh, is loved, the reason they made a movie about him during the Second World War is he unified all of the areas of Russia. And when they were unified, they could then, you know, begin economic development. The reason the Qing Dynasty is so widely loved in China is, again, because they unified all of China. Right. And so the strategy of the of the imperialists for dominating Eurasia has long been to break it into pieces, play all the ethnic groups against each other, um, you know, you know, break it into different factions, you know, and as Brzezinski put it, keep the barbarians killing each other. And it seemed like Eurasia was starting, we saw the very beginning of, of kind of the, the, the blowback of, of neoliberalism after the fall of the Soviet Union. There was starting to be some talk of maybe some kind of new Silk Road or the Belt and Road out of China, 
Putin was coming into office in Russia, and that's when the United States felt it necessary to get in there and, and stop that as quickly as they could. Um, and that seems to be what they spent the last 20 years doing, is trying to prevent economic development uh, in Central Asia. And how beautifully it has backfired, Caleb, when we look now, at the most likely scenario seems to be precisely that Afghanistan is going to be uh, absorbed into um, the Belt and Road Initiative, into the China-Pakistan corridor, that that will be the way that it can become secure and get some development. And that will only strengthen the anti-imperialist forces and raise up the life of the people whilst really uh, stumping the plans of imperialism. And, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful outcome to a 20-year imperialist endeavour, I have to say. Um, and it was interesting to me to see the session in the British Parliament uh, when they all came rushing back from their holiday to de deal with the emergency uh, that they were, in fact, utterly powerless to do anything about. They had no say in anything. They had no say in the invasion, in the occupation, in the running of the operation, in the way that the uh, evacuation happened, in none of it. And what I thought when I was looking at these guys all shouting and blaming each other and crying their hearts out over the, the soldiers or the women or whoever it was they decided to, to pin their tears onto, that it was a real case of consciousness lagging behind reality. It's like the British establishment and the British ruling class that finally got the message that Britain is not as powerful as it likes to think it is. You know, it has they've sort of known for a long time that they have to hitch their wagon to one or another big imperial project and the big split in the british ruling class since the second world war has been which imperial project do we hitch our cart to are we a big fish in the european pond in that imperial project or are we a junior partner to the american imperial uh, uh project and really the divide depends on what kind of uh capital you represent. If you're a banker, if you're into oil and armaments, you think a good idea is to hitch yourself to the American war chariot. If you're making almost anything else with your money, you tend to, you tend to side with the European side. But you can see which side's been stronger by the policies of the British ruling class over the last 20 years. You know, we are dominated by the banks, the oil, the, the financiers, the, the uh, arms manufacturers to a great extent. Uh, and you, you, that was absolutely personified by Tony Blair, but uh, it's not only by, not only by him. Um, but it was really fascinating to see them sort of waking up and beating their chests over their um, helplessness, in fact, in the face of this massive defeat. Um, and it brought to words, it brought to mind for me the words of an Iranian professor, uh, Mohammed Morandi. He was on. Um, uh, George's show a few weeks ago, and he summed it up really beautifully. He said, the world has changed. The world has changed. In the last 20 years, while America's been fighting these wars and exporting violence all over the globe, everybody else wasn't just sitting still and waiting to be the next victim. People have understood lessons of what imperialism is in a way that no amount of lectures on Lenin could have done from their practical experience all over the Middle East, Resistance movements have been developing and growing. Iran is not only rising itself, but is connected to the resistance movements all across the Middle East, which are growing stronger by the day, you know, and totally outgunning now between them. Israel, which was supposed to dominate the region on behalf of imperialism. And then we see Russia and we see China. And who is it who is engaging with the new Afghan government? Who is it who's offering emergency aid and relief to the Afghan people rather than sanctions to starve them? Who is it who's offering them economic development that's meaningful, meaningful trade, meaningful development, meaningful infrastructure? You know, you, you can see video of the of the highway that the Chinese have built into Pakistan and imagine what they'll do for Afghanistan. You know, these are real tangible benefits which will change people's lives significantly. Um, and. And to me, it's a really wonderful thing to see. And, and, and those words of uh, Professor Morandi's, the world has changed, really rang very true for me. And I just want to open it up to you guys, you know, on that note, the world has changed. Um, well, yeah, Dottie, what, what we have to look at? I'm looking 
from a direction of a lot of guys behind me called Raw Marines. A lot of them lost their lives. A lot of them were seriously injured. And the vibes I'm getting from them is it wasn't a waste of time if. It's a big if. Uh, and Richard will back me up. When you go into an operation in any of the branches of the armed forces, yes, you have a job to do, but you always try and do that little bit extra for the local population. It's called hearts and minds. Sometimes not all, always possible if they don't want you to. But what I'm, what I would personally vote for was the Taliban has changed. The Taliban, the Taliban become stable. I mean, unity is strength. We know unity is strength. They must get the Afghan tribes together. The only way to do that is a project from China that benefits the whole country. Now, I think what you would want as a serviceman, when you, if you went in there, like I say, I was never there, is your little bit help. Education continues. Infrastructure investment comes in. But the big thing for me is, it's like you said earlier, Jotty, is let's get away from America. Let's become an independent nation with the best armed forces in the world where we can go to help. And I mean, really mean to help humanitarian aid. We have the men, we have the equipment. We've got air aircraft carriers that produce an enormous amount of water. This is what we should be doing. We should be looking to be a nation where people say the armed forces, they're absolutely brilliant. They come, they build, they help. Everybody, I, I think now everybody is, is a is a battle medic. Everybody has these medical skills. Let's get away from America. Let's get away. We don't want to be part of the European army. Let's stay independent and use our armed forces to the best of their ability. Which Thanks, Dave. And of course, we've got a wonderful example of what that looks like in Cuba, don't we? Mm -hmm. Yes. Cuba endlessly yeah. sends doctors and all kinds of experts to help people in all kinds of emergency situations. Uh, they've helped medics all around the world for COVID, although they've had a difficult time themselves. They send people to help with earthquakes, with tornadoes, you name it. There's a Cuban brigade turning up to help people. And you're right, that is a way to hearts and minds all over the world when your help is offered with no strings attached, human to human. And that's what humanitarian aid should be. We have this label humanitarian aid that's put on all kinds of black operations run by the imperialists carrying out their own pursuit of profit uh, operations. And they put these labels, humanitarian aid, on the front of it. And it gives the whole concept a nasty uh, taste in the mouth and a very bad name with the people of the world. They've had enough of the, the, the imperialists' humanitarianism. But real humanitarianism, people to people, nation to nation, expertise given freely and willingly to help other human beings. Uh, yeah, that's something that will always be appreciated. And that's the kind of country I think we can all aspire to, definitely. Yeah, um, no, 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 no strings, no strings attached, Jotty. No strings. And no, yeah. the, the, the only thing you get is a handshake. That's all we want. There we go. We've done it. See you later. Bye-bye. You know, go in there and help. Shake the hand. How's that? That's great. Thanks for your help. Cheerio. Bye-bye. You know, I'd like to touch on, you know, the, the human cost of this war because, um, you know, we're on here talking about history and, and facts and details. But I mean, I just want to talk about some of my own direct experience. I'm from a small town in Ohio. Uh, I graduated from a high school class of about 115. And a number of students that I went to school with uh, went to Afghanistan and fought in Afghanistan. Um, and I, I, will, I will never forget the day, uh, it was five or six years ago, my phone rang uh, and someone called me and they said, you need to get on Facebook right now and look at what this woman who I went to school with uh, was saying. She was on Facebook and she was in Afghanistan. She was one of the occupying US forces and she was on there just letting, letting everything come out. I don't wanna be here. The people here don't want us to be here. This is an awful place. 
I'm miserable, you know, and and she was not holding back on social media. I don't know what the rules are about military folks, folks talking on social media. I don't know if she got in any trouble, but people were showing me these posts of this person I went to school with just saying, why are we here? They don't want us here. I don't want to be here. This is awful. This is horrible. Um, and it was it was almost kind of comical in a way. Um, but there's been another, I mean, there's, you know, the, the thing about Afghanistan, you talk about, you know, uh, you know, the heroin epidemic that has devastated in the last, you know, few years that has devastated so many communities throughout the United States. I mean, it's just, it's massive and it has a lot to do with what happened in Afghanistan. I mean, opioid deaths in the United States, especially since the pandemic have just skyrocketed. I mean, working class people whose lives have been destroyed and it has a lot to do with facing the stress of being low income and not being able to pay your bills and worried about feeding your kids and worried about, you know, if your home is gonna get foreclosed if you don't make this payment. And amid that stress, a lot of people have succumbed to this opioid epidemic. We find out that big pharma was also, uh, you know, over prescribed prescribing, you know, opioids. They were pushing doctors to over-prescribe opioid medications. And, and this all kind of culminated in a crisis that every day, I mean, there's a body count in the United States and it's related to Afghanistan and it's related to the whole global system of imperialism, the decline of living standards, uh, the, the greed of big pharma corporations, as well as the imperialist, uh, you know, imperialist project in Afghanistan. Another thing that I, I want to add is, you know, there's another, some friend of mine uh, who, uh, his job is he trains truckers. Uh, he, he does a, a trucking school. He trains people to, to be truckers. Um, and a lot of the people he trains are, are former soldiers uh, who were, you know, who were driving trucks in Afghanistan. Um, one of the saddest stories I heard was that, uh, you know, right after the, uh, the shootings in, in Paris, after the, the ISIS terrorist attacks, uh, one of these, one of these, you know, truckers he'd been working with, a guy who'd served in Afghanistan, uh, you know, uh, he heard about that and he refused to leave his home. Uh, he had PTSD, you know, because you can imagine the experience of driving, driving down the highways of Afghanistan with the fear at any point you might get blown up, you might get shot, maybe seeing or witnessing another truck or another, another car get blown up or, and all of this. And so, you know, he was, you know, just getting, trying to get his license to be a trucker back in the United States that's not in the middle of a civil war. And, you know, he immediately heard, you know, the, about the shootings and he, he suddenly this, this, this man wouldn't leave his home. Uh, out of fear. I mean, and that kind of shows the human cost of, of this occupation. I mean, I mean, so many people uh, have have been affected by this. I mean, you know, we talk about, uh, you know, the number of dead, right? It's in the thousands, but that doesn't include the number of people who've lost arms or lost legs, uh, you know, or the number of people who are just traumatized with PTSD. Um, you know, this has been so bad for the United States. And there's a, a lot of debate now online uh, about, you know, can one call themselves a socialist? And can one, you know, call themselves an anti-imperialist and be patriotic and be, you know, a patriotic citizen? And I would argue that you can and that these wars are the most unpatriotic things. They're bad for America. You go, you go throughout America's working class communities. Uh, there's many people, many people who, who love their country, uh, who love their community and, and are angry to see, you know, their, their kids sent off to die in these wars, are angry to see the economic devastation that has been brought by this global financial system of free market capitalism. I think opposing this war and, and calling out the big banks and corporations and military contractors that have benefited from it is probably the highest expression of patriotism. Uh, you know, and deep down, millions of Americans know that, that, that the leaders of this country are not loyal to them, are not trying to make their life better. And Donald Trump got elected on a platform of saying he was going to stop meddling around the world, that he was going to stop, stop intervening. And uh, it's really the right uh, in the United States that have kind of become the voice of non-interventionism because the left has just focused on identity politics and has focused on kind of, you know, attacking populism and, and waging a culture war against religious folks and such. And because of that, uh, we have this very odd situation where there's a lot of working class people uh, who, you know, are angry and sick and tired of these wars uh, and they're, they're rallying around the right wing. Um, so it's a very confusing situation politically as we're seeing, you know, the, the continual, the de continual decline of Western capitalism. Uh, things are getting very confusing, but ultimately um, I, I think millions of working class people have very anti-imperialist views. I mean, you talk to average Americans from red states, from small towns like the one I grew up in, uh, they're against these wars. Um, it's the liberals. It's those those 
college educated middle class liberals uh, who say, oh, well, the women, we have to be there. And and the Soviet Union killed uh, so many Afghans and, uh, you know, and, and you know, the blah, 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 and Iran and, you know, you know, you know it's the, the educated elite uh, that are the ones that uh, that favor intervention. It, it's very odd. It used to be during the Cold War. It was, you know, most of, of the U.S. population was inculcated with this pro-imperialist anti-communism. And the universities kind of served as as kind of the, uh, you know, the, the place where people learned that there's two sides to the story and that, you know, not everything is completely black and white. Now it's completely flipped. Now average working class Americans, maybe they don't know a lot about Afghan history. But they don't want us there. They say, you know, America first. Let's focus on making a better country here and stop bombing and destroying other countries. Um, and people go to college and they get, you know, they get into academia to learn why it is you have to be an imperialist and why we're spreading these sophisticated liberal values all over the world. Things are, are very strange politically. This is definitely a new a new ballpark, uh, as we would say over here, right? It's a, it's a new it's a new ballpark because uh, because politics and the political landscape is really shifting, and that's why I look with such inspiration to what you all are doing with the Workers Party. And I think what you guys are doing is the future. This is the future of socialism, right? Is is what you guys are doing with the Workers Party because you're breaking out of this false. Uh, confused left-right paradigm where where working people are, are in feeling increasingly alienated from what calls itself left. And uh, here in the United States, I tell people more and more to just pay attention to what, what Jyoti Brar, what George Galloway, what others are doing with the Workers' Party, because this is the future of socialism. And, and in the United States, if we want working class people to begin fighting for their own interests, they need to start talking uh, less like uh, like college professors and uh, uh, social justice warriors on the internet and more like more like you guys. That's beautiful, thanks Caleb. And it's a perfect moment to wrap up really because um, it does bring us back to what we're all doing here. We founded the Workers' Party precisely because uh, there is no interest for working class people uh, in the perpetuation of these wars. They strengthen our class enemies. They do nothing for us except take our lives, take our resources. Uh, terrible crimes are committed in our names and we are expected to bear the brunt and pay the price of those crimes. Uh, that's why the Workers' Party's programme has as its number one point an end to imperialist wars and financial domination, starting with withdrawal from NATO. And we're absolutely unequivocal about that. We would never budge from that position. We are anti-imperialist to our core. We are on the side of all those who fight against imperialism because we understand that imperialism is our enemy as well as the enemy of the peoples all over the, all over the world who, who are plundered uh, by imperialism. And, um, you know, you're right, Caleb. You know, British workers, workers all over the imperialist world, we need to start fighting back. We need to start to unite on a class basis to fight in our own interests and to recognize who else is on our side. We do not in the Workers' Party. We love our country because we're from here. We are from here and all of our friends are from here and our relations are from here and this is who we are. We are British and we will not be ashamed of being British, but nor will we identify ourselves with our ruling class. They are not on our side. Our culture is not their culture. Our interests are not their interests. We have our own Britain that we are fighting for, the Britain of the workers, of the working people. And it's, we hope it will be a proud Britain and a Britain that has a lot to contribute to the world with its expertise and its creativity and all those other things which are systematically stifled right now. But we have a lot to offer the world as people, human to human, as Dave was saying. And we look forward to being in a position when we can really do that and play a useful role in the world instead of being constantly ashamed of the role our country plays in the world and embarrassed by it. Uh, but to, we are not embarrassed to be British, that's for sure. Um, and so I would wrap up just by asking people, uh, this is the first one of these we've done. So leave a comment if you like it or you don't like it. Uh, let us know if you want, to, if you want more of this. Um, and um, check out, if you haven't already, check out the Workers' Party uh, website, look at our About page, you'll see our 10-point programme there. We want to be as broad as possible an organisation of the working class. We don't demand uh, unity on every single question. You don't have to agree with everything George says, you don't have to agree with everything I say. You just have to accept our 10-point programme as the unifying force that helps us to unite 
to organize, to grow. The working class people desperately need a voice and we want to be that voice. So thank you very much once again to our guests for joining us today. Thank you to you for listening and uh, I hope to see you again soon.